Welcome to the Radiology Vault, an open repository for radiology educational content designed for learners and medical professionals. Presented by the Michigan Medicine Department of Radiology. Hi, I'm Kara Getke Utiger, and this talk is about osteomyelitis in adults. And this is what you need to know when you see these cases on call. The vast majority of the time in adults, bone infection comes from contiguous spread from adjacent tissues, which usually means diabetic foot ulcers, decubitus ulcers, or spread of infection after surgery or from trauma. This is really important because it often helps you identify the area of osteomyelitis. If you find the ulcer or the surgical site, it points you to the abnormal bone. Much less commonly, bones can get infected by direct inoculation, like from infected hardware or an open fracture, or from hematogenous spread, which is much more common in pediatric patients. The imaging findings will make more sense if you understand how infection progresses in bone. So after the initial inoculation, there are reactive changes that lead to edema or fluid in the soft tissue and then the bone. There's progression to bone destruction, which includes replacement of fatty marrow, and then eventually abscess formation and devascularization, possibly forming a sequestrum, which is a piece of necrotic bone. And then finally, as the bone tries to wall off the infection and heal, there is new bone formation that makes up the involucrum, which is a layer of living bones surrounding the necrotic area. We're going to focus a lot on the imaging on this area right here, which is where the infection goes from soft tissue into the bone. With contiguous spread from soft tissues, the infection goes from the outer layer of bone in. So first, the infection contacts the periosteum, which is called periostitis. Then the cortex becomes involved, which is sometimes called osteitis. And then last, the infection involves the marrow, which is osteomyelitis. On call, you're mostly going to be looking at radiographs, which are the first line study for evaluating osteomyelitis, and then MRI, which will give the most information about soft tissue and bone changes, especially bone marrow. For patients who can't get an MRI, CT will give some additional information, but won't show all the marrow changes. Nuclear medicine scans can also help with problem solving, but they won't be covered here. Remember, when looking at imaging for osteomyelitis, that infection is an aggressive process. So we're looking for evidence of bone destruction. These are the radiographic findings of acute osteomyelitis, meaning the first few days to weeks. Remember, this is an aggressive process, so we're looking for destruction of bone, meaning erosion or lucency. Radiographs will also show us soft tissue changes. So if we can find the soft tissue ulcer, like here, or soft tissue gas, like in this toe, those findings will point to look in the underlying bone, like to see the erosion and lucency in this distal phalanx. With chronic osteomyelitis, there's osseous remodeling and irregularity as the bone tries to heal from the infection. And on radiographs, it's possible to see the interface between the necrotic sequestrum centrally and the living bone or involucrum that forms around it. Osteomyelitis is aggressive, so it gets worse over time. These radiographs show a normal appearance of the second and third metatarsal heads when the patient presented with the plantar foot ulcer. And then two months later, there's lucency and erosion of the metatarsal heads with a fracture of the third metatarsal head, subluxation at the MTP joints and sclerotic changes in the distal metatarsals from chronic osseous remodeling. This is a radiograph of a foot in a diabetic patient with an ulcer over the fifth metatarsal base. There's soft tissue gas pointing to the underlying bone with subtle findings of cortical thinning and lucency in the metatarsal base. This looks like osteomyelitis. And the next step to confirm this would be an MRI. This is an MRI of the same patient's foot. These are axial images focusing on the lateral midfoot region. There's soft tissue ulceration laterally with underlying low signal foci of gas and a non-enhancing tract on the post-contrast images. When we look at the adjacent fifth metatarsal base, there are marrow signal changes. There's low signal on T1-weighted images, high signal on T2-weighted images, and enhancement on post-contrast images consistent with osteomyelitis. So when looking at MRI for osteomyelitis, we look for first edema or fluid on T2-weighted images, low signal or mirror replacement on T1-weighted images, and then post-contrast enhancement if we have those images. But enhancement is helpful, not totally necessary to make the diagnosis of osteomyelitis.
let's go back to the process of infection. And we see that those T2 signal changes come first in the soft tissue and the bone. And then as the infection progresses into the bone, we start to see that low signal on T1, which is marrow replacement. It starts out looking faint and patchy and then fills in. And then we usually see enhancement around the same time. And then we would go on to see abscess and necrosis. So let's go through that progression on imaging. These are coronal MR images of a patient with a plantar foot ulcer here. There are signal changes in the subcutaneous fat, including fat replacement, edema, and enhancement, but no signal changes in the underlying bone marrow. So this patient has findings suggestive of cellulitis, but not osteomyelitis. This shows the next step in this progression. There are ax these are axial images of the foot in a patient with an ulcer in the region of the fifth metatarsal head. There's a soft tissue defect overlying the bone with edema and patchy low signal in the fat. There's normal fat signal in the fifth metatarsal head on T1 weighted images. And there's high signal in that same area on the T2 weighted images. So in other words, there's no marrow replacement at all, but there's edema or fluid in the bone. So at this point, it could be that the edema is reactive or there could be a developing infection that's spreading contiguously. So in this case, we would report the marrow edema and the lack of marrow replacement. And while this is not definitively osteomyelitis, this could indicate an early infection or developing osteomyelitis. This case shows the next step. This is another, di another patient with a, a diabetic foot ulcer along the lateral foot. There are sub-Q signal changes with low T1 and high T2 signal. And in the adjacent fifth metatarsal, we see patchy edema on T2-weighted images, and then an indistinct cortex on T1-weighted images with some patchy low signal. So given the ulcer and the underlying marrow signal changes, this is osteomyelitis that's early in that progression. Here's another example case. These are coronal images for a patient with a soft tissue ulcer on the plantar heel. When we look at the calcaneal marrow, we see this patchy low signal on T1-weighted images, high signal on T2-weighted images, and post-contrast enhancement. This is consistent with osteomyelitis. And then another example, there are axial images from um, a foot MRI from a patient with a soft tissue ulcer over the first metatarsal head. This shows us where to look. We look at the bone marrow in the first metatarsal head and we see this marrow replacement on T1-weighted images with edema and post-contrast enhancement. These are the signal characteristics consistent with osteomyelitis. Just a brief word about CT findings. The imaging findings of osteomyelitis are similar to radiographs. We're looking for lucency and erosion in the acute setting and then chronic changes like sclerosis. The image on the left of the screen here is a patient with lateral ulcer over the hip and on this image, there's soft tissue gas and a hip joint effusion, suggestive of septic arthritis. And then patchy lucency and early erosion of the femoral head that suggests developing acute osteomyelitis. The imaging on the right of the screen is a different patient with a decubitus ulcer with gas tracking to the ischial tuberosity, which looks sclerotic, and there's fuzzy periosteal reaction consistent with chronic osteomyelitis. So you're a pro now. These are the things to remember on call. Osteomyelitis usually comes from contiguous spread, and you can use the soft tissue ulcer to help you find it. Osteomyelitis is a progression of changes from edema to marrow replacement. So when you're looking at MRI for osteomyelitis, keep the process in mind. You will see edema or high signal on T2-weighted images, then low signal or marrow replacement on T1-weighted images. And then remember the post-contrast enhancement images are helpful, but you don't need those sequences to make the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. If you see a soft tissue ulcer and the underlying marrow has edema on T2-weighted images, but normal fat signal on T1-weighted images, it could be early osteomyelitis. And if you can remember these things, you should be all set to evaluate osteomyelitis on call. Thank you.